So tonight's speaker is originally from Teddy Roosevelt's hometown of Oyster Bay, New York. He has lived in New Mexico since 1973. Tonight's lecturer earned his PhD in history at the University of New Mexico in 1979. He has taught history at the University of New Mexico's Valencia campus since that same year. He is now a Regents Professor of History. He is the, co he is the author, co-author, or editor of 21 books, as well as over 100 articles and chapters about New Mexico history. He brought some of his books up here tonight, so if you'd like to purchase afterwards, he has a few up here, okay? Um, so come and do that. Uh, he is past president of both the Historical Society of New Mexico and the Valencia County Historical Society. Among the many awards he has received for writing, teaching, and service to his profession, he is most proud of receiving the University of New Mexico's Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award. Mm -hmm. He is married to Rena Chavez and has two grown children, Cam and Rick, a granddaughter, Luisa Marie, and a grandson, Ben. Tonight's lecture and his wife live in Belen, New Mexico. Now, he also has three books coming out. Um, number one is the third book in his trilogy on the history of Valencia County. Um, the second one has been 20 years in the making, and it's the biography of Maximiliano Luna, who was the highest ranking Hispanic in the Rough Riders. Um, and then his third book, which I'm almost certain you will be purchasing, <laughs> is called Far Stranger Than Fiction, and it's obituaries, letters, letters, letters to the editor, and ads from New Mexico. Let's give a big warm welcome to Dr. Richard Melvin. Thank you, Tyler. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight and see so many friendly faces. I always enjoy coming to Los Alamos, especially today. It was such a beautiful day to travel up here. Dorothy is really sorry that she can't be with you. You know, we talked about this a couple of months ago. Uh, we were thinking, you know, February could be snow when she's coming up from <laughs> Roswell. And uh, uh, so she was really uncertain about it. So I'm, I'm glad I can pinch hit. Although I did have a, a, a really scary experience last night. I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it because I, I was walking home and in the dark and uh, suddenly I heard something behind me. And I looked behind me, and it was a coffin walking behind me. <laughs> so I walked a little faster. <laughs> and the coffin walked a little faster. And I began to run, and it ran. And I ran all the way home, and I ran into the house, and I thought, where could I go for protection? I ran into the bathroom, and it stood there at the bathroom door, and I grabbed something out of the, the medicine cabinet, and there was cough syrup, and I threw it at him, and the coffin stopped. <laughs> oh, really. Aren't you glad I didn't throw mouthwash at him? <laughs> He'd be chasing me up here. See, the, one of the reasons I, I love to come up here is because I know you all have a great sense of humor. <laughs> and you always qualify for a discount on my books if you laugh at my my crummy jokes. So I guess you're all qualified for, for, for that. So I've been asked to talk to you about security at uh, Los Alamos in World War II, and, and how interesting that, I don't know if you noticed in the newspaper, the Albuquerque Journal, uh, the Manhattan series that uh, was on for two years has been canceled. And uh, how many people saw it, any of that series? Yeah. I, but what did you think of it? Did you, did you think it was accurate, it was good, or melodramatic? Yeah. It's historical fiction, wasn't it? Yeah, and I can't stand historical fiction because you don't know what's true and what's not true. But one time I was reading a Tony Hillerman book, it was uh, Rodolfo Naya, and uh, there was something in the book that was really interesting. So I wrote him. I said, is that true? Page 52, is, is that a true fact? And uh, he, he wrote back, uh, dear Richard, writers make stuff up. Rodolfo Anaya. <laughs> <laughs> So I couldn't even footnote it. It was really upsetting. So I just l watched uh, one episode of, of Manhattan. I, I, I couldn't do any more. So I'm kind of glad it's canceled and they've stopped spreading those rumors about uh, Los Alamos. So uh, uh, this, this discussion is based on a book I wrote a couple years ago called Breakdown, uh, how the secret to the atomic bomb was uh, stolen during World War II here in, in, in Los Alamos. So it's got three parts to it. The first part of the book is the theory, what was supposed to happen here. After all, this is supposed to be the most secure uh, operation uh, of the entire war in, in the United States, right here in Manhattan, site Y. 
of, of the Manhattan Project. And of course, the Manhattan Project was huge. We sometimes forget that, uh, that it was all across the United States, many different operations. But of course, we know the main operation was right here, the design. Can you tip that up so we can see it better in the back? Yeah. Is the lighting OK? Yeah. Is that better? Good. All right, good. So uh, the, the main operation, of course, was the design of the bomb was right here in Los Alamos at Site, site Y. And uh, under the command of the, the, the entire man. I'm sorry? Oak Ridge is why. No, we're Site Y. Yeah. Site Y was, uh, we were Site, Los Alamos is Site Y. What was Oak Ridge? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Good. All right. Please help me. <laughs> I, I said to my wife, I'm so scared. I'm preaching to the choir tonight. Yeah, the choir is going to know much more than I do. So please help me out, Dorothy. I re really appreciate your help. So uh, uh, General Groves, of course, was a commander of the entire uh, Manhattan Project. He, he was quite a character. I'm sure you'll agree. He was quite a character. You know, he's a West Point graduate in engineering, and he was felt much more comfortable as an engineer. Uh, before the Manhattan Project, uh, he had completed what big project? Anyone know? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, am I scared. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I thought maybe a couple of people would know. He, 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 uh, he helped construct the, uh, the, the Pentagon. Uh, but he was given this uh, really important assignment, of course. And um, he made sure he had a, a good scientist to help him out. And uh, I'm not even going to ask you who that was. <laughs> There he is. And uh, uh, they met, and Groves was very impressed by Oppenheimer, which is unusual because Groves didn't trust, to say the least, they didn't trust scientists, did he? Uh, he said that half of them should be put in jail because they, they talk too much, and the other one should be shot on, on, the, on the spot because he didn't like uh, their, their compromising security. Uh, but you know, that, that's counter to uh, the scientific culture, isn't it? Uh, scientists like to talk like to share information uh, uh, in conferences and, and papers in person. And uh, so this is a, a difficult thing. So uh, 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 Rose chose Oppenheimer for, for so many different reasons. First of all, because Oppenheimer could explain physics to an engineer. Otherwise, uh, Rose would have had a really tough time uh, de dealing with it. Now, Oppenheimer, a, a, a great mind, of course, at uh, University of California and, 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 and Caltech, uh, but uh, he was able to do this. And the other thing was uh, 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 Rose trusted Oppenheimer. He even suggested to Oppenheimer that the scientists uh, should become officers. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> yeah. So they had to salute each other and take orders from each other. I don't think that's going to work. But Oppenheimer went with it for a while. He even had a, a suit fitted out for himself in, in San Francisco un until he thought about it long enough. And, talked to some other scientists about it and realized this was just not going to happen. So I'll give you an outline. Uh, I, I, I think we got most people uh, with, with the outline to, to show you what uh, we plan to talk about tonight. Uh, first, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the theory of why uh, of, of the Los Alamos project and, and the security here. And the first thing, of course, was the location. Uh, there's so many reasons why it was chosen. Uh, and <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask you, what's one good reason it was chosen? <laughs> so isolated, tremendously isolated. And uh, I, I know you don't appreciate that because you drive it, drive it on a regular basis. But every time I come up here, I'm just amazed at the road and, 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 and you know, the, the steepness and, and, and the winding road. And think back there in the early 40s, that was a dirt road, hardly more than a, a, a lane wide. So it's very, very isolated. They thought that was a tremendous security a a advantage. And only two ways in, you know, the front gate and, and the back gate. Any other reasons why they would choose this place? There's a, a ranch school, sure, the ranch school is here. And Oppenheimer thought that this was big enough. If they could take over the ranch school, they'd close it down, at least temporarily. This was big enough for all the scientists and the support staff they needed. He thought they'd need about 18 scientists and about 16 support staff. And, and he said, <laughs> I know, <laughs> he said that was the biggest mistake he made in the entire war, 
uh, because by 1945 there were 5,000 people up here. And uh, so uh, it, was, it, was, it was chosen for that reason, but it uh, certainly wasn't, uh, 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 didn't happen. Uh, then of course it's, it's isolated, but it's relatively close to major transportation. Uh, Route 66, relatively close. Uh, the ra railroad, relatively close. So they could bring people and, and supplies uh, in, in and out of, of, of Los Almos. So it's an isolated place, and of course they, they had to bring the families here, didn't they? They had to bring the families. Uh, largely because Oppenheimer, who was a really good salesman in recruiting scientists, uh, uh, was not successful at recruiting all the scientists he tried to recruit. Uh, because so many people didn't want to come up here or anywhere and leave their families behind. And so uh, one way to, to, to help uh, uh, encourage scientists to, to move here for the duration of the war was to promise the families can come along. Also, of course, that meant that the scientists wouldn't want to go home on a regular basis and have to travel around the, the whole country and not be able to focus on their work here and maybe go home and have the uh, security compromised in one way or another there. Uh, so uh, they brought the, the, the families here uh, for, for their protection against uh, 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 spies, possible sto spies and espionage. And then to watch them, of course, <laughs> put them under a microscope so that uh, they could make sure that they weren't uh, talking to the wrong people and doing the wrong things. Uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, that when they got up here, uh, many families uh, renamed it, not Los Almos, but Lost Almost. Because <laughs> they felt still up. <laughs> That's a good thing, isn't it, Darcy? Yeah. All right, so the security clearances. Before you could come up here, uh, you had to go through a security clearance uh, uh, system, and they gave you a long questionnaire, and they asked all about your background and where you went to school, and things like uh, what countries you have visited in the recent past, and what uh, contacts you have made, what military you were in, right, in the United States or some other place. They wanted to know all about uh, all, all these things. They were especially looking for uh, felons that they couldn't trust and uh, communists. And they, they were very uh, aware of that. And, and even though, of course, we have to face that incredible contradiction that the Soviet Union, of course, was our ally during the war. A uh, marriage of convenience, obviously, uh, because we were fighting the fascists. Otherwise, it uh, probably would never have happened. So they, uh, it usually took about a month to go through all the, the, the clearance uh, checks. Wow. And uh, uh, it, it, it was a quite, quite a process. Uh, Mac Hull, who was a provost at, at uh, the University of New Mexico for many years, uh, told me that uh, when he came to Los Alamos, uh, they, they, they traveled in a train, he and a group of other uh, fellows, and uh, they had a, a pile of envelopes. And when they got into each city, he was supposed to open the next envelope to find out where they're going to go next. <laughs> yeah, and, and then call in and say they, they, they made it that far. And of course, the ultimate uh, uh, goal, goal was to get to Santa Fe and, and meet up with Dorothy McGibbon, right? Dorothy McGibbon. And uh, it's such a, a, a great person to welcome these people who were so anxious, of course, about the trip and what they were, or what they were, where they were going and that were what they were going to be uh, doing. So they, they finally get up here. Uh, they went through security briefings by the uh, uh, security chief. And then, of course, they received the, the daily bulletin. And uh, as an early form, a pr kind of primitive form of... Um, a newspaper. Here, of course, is 109 East Palace Avenue, where people were welcomed by Dorothy. And here is a rather sad picture of Dorothy. That's her security picture. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they had to come through the, the main gate. And their, their security uh, clearance had to be uh, checked by the guard there. Uh, I've always looked at this picture, and it worries me. <laughs> Does that picture worry you? Yeah. <laughs> What's to worry? <laughs> the bullet hole. The bullet hole, right, yeah. You must have been shot at it on the way up on the hill, don't you think? Yeah. Anything else kind of strange about this fellow? He didn't look very trustworthy to me. He's wearing sunglasses, sunglasses right? He's got the cigarette hanging around the side of the mouth there. It's really something. But he's got his security clearance, so he's, he's going through. I 
cards upside down. Yeah. The cards upside down. I, I thought you were going to say it was money. He's going to bribe this guy. I don't know. That's Richard Feynman. It's Richard. Is it really? I think so. I wouldn't no. doubt it. Yeah. More about Richard Feynman later. Yeah. A lot more about Richard Feynman later. So they, they received the daily bullshit. And uh, they had a lot of things. They talked about what was going on uh, in, 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 in on, the, on the Mesa here, including the movies. But uh, up here is all the, uh, the, the, the things you're not supposed to do at Los Alamos. Uh, don't reveal the purpose of Los Alamos, of course. Don't reveal the size of Los Alamos, the number of people. Uh, don't reveal the size and location of any of the utilities supplying Los Alamos. Uh, don't reveal the size, location, description of the workshops and, and, the, and the equipment here. Uh, the method used protection of the installation. Uh, per, the portion of the work is in process. Don't talk about any of those things. Uh, don't reveal the nature of supplies received. And they got this message over and over again. Not daily, but on, on a regular basis. So they were well briefed and, and uh, re ready to go. Uh, they, of course, uh, got their security badges. And uh, here is General Groves. I don't think he looks too happy. First of all, because someone made a typo. Yeah, some, some private put Grover. Yeah, Leslie Grover. <laughs> and he just found out about it. That's why he's making this face. I mean, he was never very a happy man, especially with this. He probably suspected this. A scientist did that, don't you think? Yeah. He looks thinner in this picture than the other one he showed. Is that right? Well, that's, what, that's how he looked when he got mad. <laughs> and uh, here's Oppenheimer. And of course, it's, it's tough to recognize Oppenheimer because he doesn't have a a hat and a pipe, right? Sure. But I guess he had to take them off for the security clearance there. And they got all uh, different security um, cards. And each card, of course, had a different color. I'm sorry, that's not in color. Uh, but the white, white card meant you could go anywhere. You could go anywhere in, in the labs. Uh, and then the, the blue cards meant that uh, you could go uh, in a restricted area. Uh, and, and just in the areas you're going to work in, and the red or yellow card uh, was a uh, lower security areas w within, within the labs. So you were checked as you went into the la uh, lab area as well as when you came in to the town in general. So here is the entrance to the main entrance, the, the, the tech area. All right, fences all around those almost, especially around the tech area. And the, the, the fences uh, were, uh, had motion detectors on them. So anyone moved those fences, trying to disturb those fences, uh, the guards would come and the MPs would come and check it out immediately. And there were MPs on horses, and they were riding around the exterior, uh, always ready to find anyone uh, interfering with the, the, the security. In terms of mail, uh, they, uh, uh, there's only one mailbox, of course, or and that, of course, was the famous 1663. How many people have read uh, Eleanor Jetty's uh, Inside Box 1663? That, that's a tremendous book, isn't it? Uh, because everything went on inside that box. Yeah, I understand even when children were born, the birthplace was inside box. I don't know how they did that. It was only about <laughs> six inches high and about 11 inches wide. Anyway. Uh, but um, uh, then they had sensors. Uh, there were 18 sensors that sat in an office above the post office. Here is a, a picture of some of the MPs. And uh, here are some of the MPs on horseback. And then in the post office, the old post office in Santa Fe, you had the censors. And uh, they would read the, the mail that was going out to make sure that people weren't mentioning the things that you weren't even supposed to have a, a picture in there for fear that people could see the background of the picture, maybe the mountains, and figure out where, the, where the, uh, these people were, were located. Uh, so they were very careful about it. And uh, they had put their uh, stamp of approval. Uh, there are some funny stories about it. Uh, one time, uh, uh, someone was sending a birthday card, I guess it was, to one of their relatives. And they, uh, on, the, on the card, they said, uh, check is enclosed. And the censor looked at it, and there was no check in it. So he, he sent it back to the, the, the person and said, you forgot the check. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was intentional. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they had to send out those 
uh, the approval that it was in fact being being um, censored. So here's the censor's mark over here. And of course it's going through box 1663. Uh, so you had to send out your mail through certain boxes so that they, in fact the censors uh, could, could take care of them. And of course the receiving mail had to be uh, checked as well. Uh, this was an incredible project. Uh, phones, they only had a limited number of phones, uh, not, not in anyone's house. Uh, the administration had phones. Uh, Groves loved to talk on the phone. It doesn't sound like a very secure uh, uh, way to de deal with all this, but he loved to call on the phone. He made uh, about 100 calls a day to the Manhattan Project all around the country. But if you were an, a private individual and living at home and you had a call, uh, then an MP would come to your door any hour of the day and night, knock on the door, and they take it down to the, the phone, and then the MP would listen. <laughs> you could only speak in English, and if you started to speak softly, they'd say, speak up, speak up. <laughs> so they could make sure that you weren't uh, spreading any information. Uh, travel was restricted, uh, at first only to Santa Fe, and then eventually to Albuquerque. And then eventually, later, we'll talk about uh, the, the, the other uh, extreme. But if you went to Santa Fe, uh, you could, especially the scientists, could expect to be followed by uh, FBI, the FBI. And the FBI, in fact, uh, had uh, people uh, hired in various places in Santa Fe. A La Fonda at the, at the, at the, the front desk there. Uh, supposedly some of those people that worked at the front desk uh, were FBI agents, just to see who was visiting in Santa Fe and who was, uh, which scientists were there at the uh, La Fonda in the restaurant or the bar. In fact, a lot of the bars had uh, bartenders who were FBI, right? Sure, so they, they were supposed to be everywhere. Let's see, they had code names for the scientists. So in the book, there's a whole list of uh, these code names and, and other things too. But uh, you can see the, the uh, actual name in the left-hand column and the code name in the right-hand column. Let's talk about the problems of all this in just a little while. <laughs> There's lots of problems here. I'm sure you could notice right, right off. Uh, they had bodyguards. The, the top scientists, at least, had bodyguards that uh, accompanied them wherever they went uh, uh, off the uh, Mesa. And then the last thing is compartment, compartment, I knew I was going to have trouble. So Compartmentalization, yeah. Groves, as a military man, believed that people should only know what they needed to know within their particular area of research, their department. And, and the scientists, especially Oppenheimer, knew that the scientists needed to hear all information so they could use that to, in, in their work. Uh, and so they made a deal uh, that the scientists would meet every Tuesday uh, and ha have a colloquium and uh, discuss their ideas and their progress. But only certain people, especially with white card security passes, uh, would be allowed into those colloquiums. All right, good, so that's the theory. It's only a pretty good security system. Any, any comments, questions about it so far? All right, you ready for reality? Yeah, all uh, right, reality sneaks in here. All right, there are so many problems. It's just, just amazing. Uh, in terms of clearances, security clearances, it might have been okay in the beginning when you're only talking about a couple of dozen people, but then you get to hundreds and then thousands of people, they just couldn't keep up with all of the security clearances as, as, as fast as they need to. So they did a cursory job and a pretty arbitrary, scattered uh, approach. It didn't work real well. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, when you think about all the scientists and, and, the, and the staff and the local people from the, the area, including Tony's father. Tony was telling me that just before uh, uh, the session today. So they, a lot of people got through that probably wouldn't have gotten through. And of course the biggest question uh, was supposed to be something that stopped them from getting through. We said felons and being Communists. communist, right? Sure. Uh, and who was the great exception who was supposed to be have had communist connections? Oppenheimer himself. 
And you know, the FBI uh, had been watching Oppenheimer and his friends uh, at the University of California from way back in the 1930s. They knew who Oppie was and what his background was, especially with his brother Frank and, and, and his wife. Uh, he had given up a lot of his communist connections be before the war, uh, but they still were watching him. And, and so when Groves chose him, they, uh, they were suspicious. Uh, they, they, the FBI suggested that they, they, uh, they, they don't give, uh, they wouldn't give Oppenheimer uh, the security clearance. But Groves insisted, and, and that's so interesting, isn't it? Everything that happens to Oppenheimer in the 40s and the 50s with his security clearance, uh, you know, that wasn't his fault. That because the FBI and the government knew that he had these these connections or these relations, uh, but they let it go through. So uh, a lot of people getting through there, and more about that later when we get to the actual uh, uh, spies. Uh, in terms of entering uh, Los Alamos, sure enough, they came in, 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 in the, uh, uh, through those gates, but it was kind of easy to get through. All you had to do was wear dark glasses, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cigarette off the mouth there. Uh, yeah, a lot of people, you know, I bet everyone has got a story or have heard a story about how to get through the gate. Uh, I mean, the, the town was closed until, what, 1958. So even during, after the war, it was, you know, kind of easy to get through. Anyone want to share uh, how to get through the gate? You, you guys are still worried about security <laughs> clearances. I, I see that here. Oh, especially the teenagers. Uh, uh, they were, once they get in and out, they would go in the? Trunk. In the trunk. All right, an honest woman. They go, yeah. <laughs> You're retired, you don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They go in the trunk, or, or sometimes in the back seat under a, uh, it sounds like going into the drive-in, doesn't it? Uh, going under a carpet or, or something. Uh, some people realize that they left Los Alamos and they didn't bring the pass with them, and so they'd come back in and they'd uh, have to do something about that. And they found out, they realized that the pass was the same size as a, 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 a box of cigarettes. And a box of cigarettes had a plastic covering, so all you had to do was flash that at the guard, especially at night, and they just let you th go through. <laughs> top security, top security. <laughs> Terrible. And then those fences, uh, they were motion detected, weren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah, motion detected. But it was, they were so sensitive that even when a bird landed on those things, <laughs> it set off the alarms and the NPs would have to go running over there and the NPs got tired of it. And so they disconnected those things, <laughs> disconnected. In fact, the MPs rode on their horses around the same route every night, and the horses knew the route, and the MPs would get tired, and they'd go to sleep, and they'd wake up, and the horse was back in the barn. <laughs> Good security of horses, I guess, I, I don't know. But then people were able to uh, en uh, enter and leave Los Alamos under the fence. Uh, kids did it on a, a regular basis, to go out into the, uh, in, into the forest and, and to play outside. And uh, people from San Luis, the neighboring area, San Luis Sanso, uh, sometimes would come in, in and out that way. And in, in fact, uh, they knew, everyone knew the security pattern uh, route of the MPs, and so you just have to wait until they had passed, and then you can go in and out. And, and, and <laughs> it was so bad that uh, some people cut, cut the fence and would be able to take their horses out to ride in the surrounding area. That's amazing. Yeah. Of course, the most famous person to do this, as he with everything, was secured. Richard Feynman. And I was so pleased to see oh, over here on, 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 on Trinity that the, they had the Richard Feynman Center for Innovative Thinking. <laughs> that is so fitting. He, he had such great innovative thinking in terms of the project, but in, especially in terms of the, the security, because uh, he challenged everything. So uh, his, his great sport was to uh, to go under the fence and then through the gate with his pass. And then he'd go under the fence and through the gate. Just to mess with the MP's mind, you know. How can he do that? He's coming in and out. And <laughs> so that was just one of many things that, that Feynman was uh, uh, n noted for. And then in terms of the mail, in terms of the mail, uh, eventually there was so much mail, they couldn't keep up. The censors couldn't keep up. So it was a random censoring. Well, for example, one scientist uh, had his uh, letter censored, and it said, you can't mention, I think it's a mountain. So uh, please correct that and send it again. And so he, he, and the, the scientist got the letter with that, that, those instructions, and he didn't correct it, and it went through. 
The second time it went through. And, and, and yes, that, that was just typical. And of course, Feynman, <laughs> that clever fellow, his, his wife uh, had TB. She was at Presbyterian Hospital in Albuquerque. So they would send letters back and forth. And just for fun, I mean, I, I would love to have met her because I can't imagine, you know, the, the kind of woman with Mary Feynman she must be full of fun. <laughs> uh, so they, they developed codes. Full of fun? Oh, so uh, they, they developed codes and sent the letters back in codes, which just drove the censors nuts. And uh, so they, the censors said, uh, you can have codes as long as you tell us the code. <laughs> <laughs> they did that. Uh, uh, but, but then, uh, uh, of course, uh, many people, once they got into Santa Fe, some people would send their letters from there rather than the drop boxes here in Los Alamos. So it was very easy uh, as they went into Santa Fe and beyond uh, to, to send out whatever they wanted to. And the travel uh, uh, limits were relaxed. By the, by the fall of 1944, they could go anywhere in the country. They go to Santa Fe, they could go to Albuquerque, they go anywhere in the country. And even if you went to Santa Fe, you knew who the FBI guys were. Those are the guys in the suits and the ties. I mean, you go to Santa Fe today, you don't see guys in suits and ties. Can you imagine back then, it was obvious who the FBI guys were. It was uh, uh, pretty bad. But for morale, Oppenheimer allowed uh, the scientists and their families to go anywhere in the country. That really was a breakdown of, of, of the security. And of course, a lot of the scientists and their families, being very curious people, uh, wanted to, to, to explore the surrounding area, uh, to go to the Pueblos, to, to go to, uh, up and down the valley. Uh, they had baseball teams that played teams all over, all over the, uh, the state. And uh, so uh, people were uh, scattered, uh, and that security broke down. About the code names, I don't, I'm sorry if you can't see that in the back. Anyone see any problems with those code names? Those top secret code names? <laughs> Similar they're very similar names, aren't they? they? In fact, they're the same initials. Yeah, same syllables, number of syllables, same initials. <coughs> it, it was absolutely ridiculous. It was easy to, uh, to figure out. I don't know uh, what, what great mind uh, came up with these, these names. And this is just a, a sample of the most famous ones. At, at work, uh, the scientists were supposed to lock their their uh, work material uh, in, in, in uh, file cabinets every, every night with a combination. And if you didn't do that, the MPs would come get you and take you out of bed and, and, and tell you to, to do that just to annoy you so you wouldn't do it again. Uh, so who, who do you think would be interested in, in uh, dealing with those locks? Feynman, yeah, sure. So this is just a challenge. I don't know how he, how, how he finds it hours in the day to work on the weapon in the day and then all night work on the security questions. So uh, it took him up to eight hours to figure out these locks and a lot faster for other locks. Uh, most people, just like today, uh, use the, the combination that comes with, uh, with the lock, right? And then, and then sometimes their birthdays and their kids' birthdays. So a lot of them are really easy to figure out. But uh, between the easy ones and the tougher ones, uh, he took an average of four hours to, uh, to figure out combinations for, for those locks. And then when he broke in to those, uh, those, those safes or file cabinets, he'd leave a note. <laughs> Wise guy, you know, and certainly what he was. Yeah. So the security system uh, broke down terribly. And, and I'm trying to tell you everything because we don't have that much time. And also so you buy the book. I noticed, <laughs> I noticed if I tell people too much, they don't buy the book because they figure they, <laughs> They know it all already, why buy the book? So I'll, I'll cut back here. Uh, any other comments or questions about uh, the reality, how all this broke down? I have a question. Nancy. They say um, if you use the word Los Alamos or atomic or whatever, and the FBI overheard you, like in at, um, La Fonda, then they would that person would disappear. Yeah. Now, I've never heard where they would disappear to. Yeah. Unless it was at two MS. And as you're saying, uh, and as you're saying that if, if you were uh, heard saying Los Alamos or uh, something about the weapon, atomic or something like that, yeah. especially in Santa Fe, yeah. uh, you'd be rounded up and sent out. Especially the, the, the military, yeah. the, the support staff, military. So, so is there any record of where these people were sent? I think it was mostly a great rumor to prevent people from saying those things. But uh, I, I do remember 
that there were some cases that were sent to Alaska. <laughs> I'm not about the front lines, but at least Alaska, and that was not the choice. But that could have been just part of the legend too, you know, to scare people off. Better here than Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I read a claim that Feynman admitted that most of the combinations he got were by searching desks and finding the little slip of paper. Is that right? <laughs> most of uh, Feynman's uh, discoveries were by looking through the desks and finding the combinations <laughs> in the in the drawer. I thought I was the only one who did that <laughs> with passwords. I can never find passwords. It's really sad. Okay, so we've got the theory and we've got the reality, and now we need the proof. And the proof that the security system broke down, of course, was uh, the spies. Uh, we know of three, of course, and they suspect there's as many as six. So let's look at the, the, uh, the three most famous cases. Now here's Feynman's security pass, by the way, and I love his smile. It just looks like he's enjoying the heck out of this. Okay, the, the first thing I wanted to mention about, about the, uh, the breakdown in security, the proof of it, was that this was not a communist conspiracy. The Soviets didn't con uh, find out about this place and conspire to send spies over here and train them as professionals and uh, follow protocol, any of that stuff. The three spies we know of were complete amateurs. They knew nothing. They, they were always breaking uh, all sorts, sorts of uh, uh, rules as spies. Uh, but still, they were successful. The system was that bad, it had broken down that much, that still they were, these total amateurs were able to uh, steal the, the secrets and relay them to the, the Soviets. Uh, their motivations. Uh, they were motivated because they were communists, yes, they all had communist connections, no doubt about that. Uh, but they were also motivated, uh, uh, I guess one of them, Greenglass, got some money, but it's mostly because he owed rent that month and he asked his, his, uh, his contact, do you have any money with you, and that sort of thing. It wasn't that he was in it for the money. Uh, the whole idea was so the United States wouldn't have a monopoly on the use of atomic force, that there'd be some counter force to prevent it. And there'd be a standoff between the two. And uh, you know, it, it, it's sad, but it's true that that's what's happened. Uh, thank goodness they were both sane enough not to use the weapon on each other. And so it is the standoff that these, these three amateurs had uh, always hoped for. So the first one, of course, is David Greenglass. And um, uh, his connection, of course, is with the Rosenbergs. Uh, this is a, a book, a good book if you haven't seen it. It's called The Brother by Sam Roberts, and it's about the green glasses. Uh, this is the, uh, there's a picture of uh, David and his wife, Ruth. Uh, so David Greenglass was the sister of Ethel Rosenberg, yeah, the sister. And he admired Julius and Ethel Rosenberg's Berg, uh, in the 1930s as he was growing up, and uh, because they were communists, uh, he was interested in Marxist ideology, and he, uh, 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 he was able to uh, uh, join several uh, communist groups. Uh, during the war, he was drafted. He became a machinist. And he didn't hold his, his tongue at all. He told everyone who was willing to listen that he was a, a Marxist and he was spreading these ideas. So one day, his commander called him in and he said, oh no, I'm going to Alaska. Because <laughs> he's, he's talking about these ideas. But instead, they sent him to Oak Ridge because <laughs> they needed machinists there. And that's what he was. And then after Oak Ridge, they sent him to Los Alamos, right, sure. And he, be he came very close uh, to several of the scientists. And the scientists, you know, usually professors, were happy to answer questions from this inquis inquisitive young man. And uh, he didn't know a lot to ask a lot of questions, but uh, he, he asked uh, 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 quite a few, as much as he could, and then he asked to be included in the colloquium on Tuesdays. And he was denied access, and he appealed it to Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer let him join. We don't know what the motivations were other than admiring this young man who wanted to know more about the process. So uh, uh, Greenglass gets access to all this information. The question is, because could he understand it, necessarily understand it? So uh, he and his wife, Greenglass and his wife, uh, uh, rented an apartment 
on 209 North High Street in Albuquerque. Anyone ever been by there? Yeah. It's uh, just south of Martin Luther King Boulevard there. Uh, for years, it was a boarding house uh, for student, UNM students. Uh, now it's a bread and breakfast. It's a wonderful place. They have the Oppenheimer rumor room and the Green Glass room and the Fuchs room. It's amazing. So you can rent them all. Really, very interesting. So uh, uh, David would go home on the, on the weekends. So his going to Albuquerque regularly was not suspicious. It was just part of his routine. And so he eventually let uh, 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 Rosenberg uh, know about uh, his, his, his work at Los Alamos and that he could share this information. He didn't bring any paper uh, from Los Alamos down, uh, but he remembered enough that when the Soviet contact, um, uh, Harry, Harry Gold, uh, arrived there at 209 uh, North High Street on a Sunday morning, he told Gold uh, to come back in about six hours. And he spent those six hours uh, writing down as much as he knew uh, to, 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 to give to, to Gold. By the way, when they met each other, uh, Rosenberg gave, gave them instructions to figure out, uh, to, to, to know whether they're talking to the right people. Did anyone know what the, the code was that they were talking to the right people? A jello box. A jello box. Yeah, each of them had half a jello box. And if they put them together, it was a whole jello box. So if one had an orange flavored jello box and the other one had a lime, you know they were talking to the wrong person. <laughs> Had to be the same flavor. Yeah. So when I went there years ago, uh, the, 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 the family that owned it, they were so nice, they were so helpful. And I asked to see uh, the, the apartment where the green glasses were. And they said, we can't do it because the, the student lives up there, he's not home right now. But they said, they'll tell you one thing about it, and I hope it's still true. <laughs> The kitchen is designed, covered, the walls are covered with jello boxes. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Good student of history, I think. All right, so he passed the information to Gold, and Gold went back. Uh, this is not critical information. It was helpful information. It was not as critical as the other two sources. Uh, after the war, of course, the FBI investigated him, and, and during the interrogation, uh, he let it be known uh, that he was connected to the Rosenbergs. Uh, not, not, not a really good brother, I think. Yeah. But he had no idea what he was saying about the Rosenbergs was going to lead to the trial and, of course, the, the, finding, the, the guilty verdict and, and the execution. He had no idea. Uh, and he made something of a plea to save not the Rosenbergs, but his, his wife, Ruth. Uh, now we have information from uh, the Soviet KGB records that Ruth probably was involved more than, than uh, we, we had thought previously. But, um, he wanted to save her. After all, he had to go home to her at night, not to the Rosenbergs. See? That, that's a joke. <laughs> I know it's a serious topic, but that, that's uh, supposed to So he was found guilty. He was sentenced to, I think it was 15 years. He served about half of it. And then uh, he died in 2014. Uh, and just before he died, he spoke to uh, this author, uh, Sam Roberts, and uh, admitted a lot of the, his, his involvement. Any comments or questions about uh, Green Glass and the Rosenbergs. Yeah, the Rosenbergs, of course, their, their son wrote a, their sons wrote a, a famous book. Uh, uh, they are our, they are our parents. It was a defense of them that they weren't guilty. But now after the KGB records have been released and other records, uh, they realize that they were uh, the, the father and uh, the, the, the mother. And they've written another book uh, admitting that, that it probably was true. Uh, the next one, is, of course, is Klaus Fuchs. And he was a communist. Oh, here, by the way, here's a picture of the uh, 209 High Street, North High Street, from the front. And then if you go in the alley in the back, uh, those are the stairs, and the apartment was at the top of the stairs. So Klaus Fuchs was a German, and he was a, a communist. Uh, with the rise of Hitler, uh, he, he fled. He fled to England, and he was known as a communist there and suffered for it. But they recognized that he was a, a great physicist, uh, so they used his, his scientific skills and knowledge to put it to good use. Uh, but then, during the war, the United States needed more scientists here, and so they recruited scientists from England. This is the famous British mission, 22 uh, uh, top flight British scientists, including Klaus Fuchs, and they didn't do any clearance on them. 
Whatever the English had done in clearance, they accepted as efficient. So here's Klaus Fuchs, another communist, coming into New Mexico, and then amazed that he's being sent in uh, and, uh, to work on this, uh, on this project. So he was a very trusted a neighbor and colleague. They all liked him. It was, I guess they would have to be disliked to be a spy. <laughs> Some nice people are spies, yes. Uh, so he, he was trusted so much that uh, some families uh, let him babysit for them. They trusted with their, their kids with them, uh, even. Uh, but uh, he uh, made contact uh, with the Soviets, and uh, he met with Harry Gold in broad daylight on a Saturday afternoon in Santa Fe. <laughs> uh, where were those FBI agents? You know, where was the bodyguard? Where, where were all those people? But this is 1945. And then, then he met also uh, back in, in Massachusetts as well, because he could travel anywhere. Uh, after the war was over, of course, he was arrested by the English, and he served seven of his 15 years. He was released, and he went uh, in those days uh, uh, behind the Iron Curtain and did fin finish out the rest of his life as a physicist for the, the communists. Sure. Any observations about Klaus Fuchs? Not a day, you notice, not a day of spy school here, right? <laughs> These people just go in and uh, get, get the information. Yes? You, you keep saying that, but, but they, they trained him for years before he came here. Who was that? Klaus Fuchs. Um, he started, he started as a spy? The Soviets in 39 or something like that. And, and they dealt with him regularly when he was in England, when he was in the Tube Alloys Project, uh, when he came over here and worked in the, in the Enrichment Project. You know, he, it was a, he had a lot of contact with the Soviet handlers. Well, I am to be, be corrected. I, I didn't realize it. It's probably in my book. I remember one time I was giving a presentation <laughs> on one of my books, and I said, wow, I didn't know that. And somebody piped up and said, that's funny. It's on page 52 of your book. <laughs> and I did try to read it last night. I don't know. But I'll check into that. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. You've got a list of known spies. you have a list of unknown spies? Here. Good question. The question is about the unknown spies. We know the three, and it's suspected there are three others. And it might have been, just like the third case with Ted Hall, that they knew about them, but they didn't want to persecute them uh, for fear they were going to reveal information that they didn't want public, especially to the Soviets. So uh, uh, Ted Hall is the third example, and he was never brought to trial by the English or the Americans uh, because they, they thought it would reveal too much. So Ted Hall was 18 years old. He was a prodigy, he was a Harvard student at the time. Uh, he had three roommates, they were all Marxists. He was obviously uh, very influenced by them. Uh, he was recruited to go uh, to Los Alamos. Uh, the, the recruiters had gone to Harvard and they tried to recruit as many young scientists as possible. He was the youngest scientist at Los Alamos. There were two of them actually, uh, both 18 years old. That's an incredible responsibility, isn't it, for a young person. To, to know about this top secret operation, and of course to trust them. So he let it be known uh, through his, his, his contacts, his, his friends back at Harvard, that uh, he was willing to share this information. So he, his instructions were to meet a Soviet contact, not Harry Gold, but in this case it's uh, uh, Lona Cohen, Lola Cohen, who was an expert spy, Soviet spy. Uh, Harry Gold, not so much. He was trained, uh, he had lots of experience, since the 1930s, but uh, Cohen definitely was a professional spy. So the deal was they were supposed to meet at UNM, on the UNM campus, and, and uh, uh, Ted Hall couldn't get away from work uh, for the, the weeks that they were supposed to meet at, at UNM. Years later, by the way, they brought him back to UNM and said, where at UNM were you supposed to meet Cohen? And it, it had changed so much. I don't know whether they're gonna put a statue up to him, I have no idea, <laughs> but they wanna know where at UNM uh, but it's changed so much, even since I I've, I've, uh, uh, first went, uh, that uh, he, he, he had no idea. So they did eventually uh, meet at the UNM campus, and he gave her information, paper information. So she wasn't going to leave from Albuquerque. That seemed too suspicious. She was going to leave from Las Vegas. So she traveled up to Las Vegas, and she put this, this, this information that uh, Ted Hall gave her in a what kind of box? Anyone know? A Kleenex box, the bottom of a Kleenex box. So she's, excuse me, she's getting on board the train, and there, there's a uh, 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 security people checking uh, people's identification. So she's a little nervous, but she's a she's a pro. She can do this, 
And uh, so she goes up to this uh, the security person, and uh, she gets her, her, her ticket out from the, the purse, and she's so smooth, she gives him the Kleenex box to hold while she's going through the purse. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And then, of course, when she shows him his, her ID and the ticket, she knows she can't ask for the Kleenex box back because that would draw attention to the Kleenex box. But she's counting on this American to be a gentleman. Yeah, so she's boarding the train, and as she's boarding, he's handing it up to her. Wow, the secret to the atomic bomb. <laughs> and she thanked him, and she went off. And after the war was over, uh, she spot, saw, saw, uh, Spy 101 or something in the Soviet Union for years and years, and she always started her, her courses by giving that anecdote, you know, uh, how to exploit the good nature of these American gentlemen. Yeah. So as a result of this information, especially from Klaus Fuchs and Ted Hall, somewhat from Greenglass, uh, the Soviets uh, used the information and were able to develop their weapon by 1949. And it, it's very much like at least one of the weapons de developed here uh, dur during the war. Uh, it, it, it's, it's considered that uh, this would have, uh, would have cut, it cut, it did cut back on the, the Soviet ability to get the atomic weapon by six years. It would have taken a, another four years after that. I'm sorry. Uh, it took them four years, it would take another four years. But uh, they got it much earlier. They were able to uh, de detonate their weapon by uh, August 1949. So uh, there, there is my presentation. You've got the, uh, the, the theory. It sounded so good, didn't it? And then the reality, and then the proof that even these amateurs, or most of these were amateurs, uh, were able to, to, uh, to, uh, to steal, finally steal the weapon. Any other comments or questions? Yes? Who originally made the Soviets aware of those elements so that they knew to try to cut well, you know, the uh, breakdown, the question was, what made the Soviets first aware of it? We don't know exactly what it was. It could have been some correspondence through the, uh, with, with the, the scientists or a breakdown in, in censoring. Uh, it was definitely by the time of, of these three spies. We can say that at least. Sure. Anything else? Who do you think Prometheus was? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's like deep throat, isn't it? Yeah, that's the big question. Who, who's that uh, mystery person? Yes. Yeah, you, you talk about 10 foot high fences. Was that on the, the security fence around the whole place in the area? Was that 10 foot high? I think that was a tech area. Oh, just a tech area. Right. Okay. So not the whole. Yeah, there were fences out there. I'm not sure if they were 10 feet high. Okay. Yeah. All right. <coughs> any, any other questions? So I noticed a couple of you. Yes, please. Well, like when they, they expanded their work, say, to working on the, the development of the implosion device done in Biocanyon, do you know how they handled security for that? The question is how they handled security down in the canyons when they were developing the weapons. I don't know. I don't know. That's a real good question. Yes, yes sir. It's my belief that they were separate, their allying sites were separately fenced. And Bio Canyon was access from State Road 4. Mm -hmm. It was ah. not access from Bronco Mesa or passed there by Bronco Mesa. And so they had to go down State Road 4 and come back up. And so I think they had a guard station and a separately fenced area. That makes sense. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, I did notice that some of you didn't laugh at my corny jokes. <laughs> so I'm going to give you one last chance. <laughs> and it, it is about this Indian princess. And the Indian princess was being courted by two warriors. And, and one warrior was named Falling Rocks, and the other one was called Running Water. And uh, she couldn't figure out who to marry. And so she asked her father, the chief, and he said, marry the one who can provide for you. Made sense. So she told Falling Rocks and Running Water to go out and hunt deer. And the first one come back with the deer, she'll marry him. And sure enough, Running Water comes back in a couple hours, he's got a deer. So by that night, she married Running Water. And uh, they, they were waiting for the return of Fallen Rocks. And they went out and searched everywhere. And, and it was terrible. They looked for years and years and years. They're still looking. There's still signs on the road that say, watch for Fallen Rocks. <laughs> I should have left it with a coffin. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.